very good morning, Pottersville family. Please can I ask if we stand up? Can we just give a praise to the Lord this morning? And I'd like to recognize that He is risen. Amen. <laughs> So thank you for joining us this morning. Please just um, recognize that if you do have a word that you would like to share with the congregation, then please do bring that forward and we will just share what the Lord is telling you with everybody else. But as we celebrate this incredible day, let's just uh, go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our dear God and loving Father, we are so grateful to you for the things that you do to demonstrate how much you love us. And Father, we thank you that we serve a victorious God and that we have victory in you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as we come together to celebrate that, Father, I just pray that your spirit will move powerfully through the congregation this morning and that each heart will be touched with the incredible power that you make available to us through your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for each person here that there be a special way in which we draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's just enjoy this service, brethren. Come on, everybody, let's clap our hands to the King of Glory. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. History, death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal. You have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive.
same, Lord Jesus, that we are forever changed by you, God. We thank you for the resurrection life, King of glory, that, God, we can look up to you, know that you have done it all for us, Lord Jesus. We celebrate you this morning, Lord Jesus. Indeed, it's a happy day. Hallelujah! <laughs> Amen.
can stop the Lord on my Think about your situation, no one can Who can stop the Lord on my Who can stop the Lord on my He's got greater plans for you Who can stop the Lord on my Who can stop the Lord Who can stop the Lord on lifted up we worship you oh God with our hands lifted up we surrender it all to you God because there is none like you sovereign God you are our father you reside in heaven oh God and yet you reside in our hearts 
Father, we open our hearts wide this morning and allow you to move us and to move in us and to live in us. In the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are here. You are here, oh God, you are pouring blessings upon your children. You are here, oh God, you are breaking chains upon the lives of your people. You are here, oh God, you are changing situations that are unchangeable. You are here, oh Father, you are lifting up burdens that are so hard on your people. Thank you, Father, that now that you have resurrected from the grave, you are alive forevermore. Your spirit is in us. Thank you, God Almighty, that you live forever. Thank you that we are free forever and we live forever because you live in us in the name of Jesus Christ we thank you Lord we give you the praise hallelujah
before you, Lord. Indeed, here is where our hope is found. Solely in you, O oh God. It's because of the cross that we live today. Lord, we lay everything at your feet, everything at the cross, where your love ran red. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you, O oh God, that we, we are no longer the same or forever changed because of that thing, that one thing you did for us has changed everything. We bless you, King of Kings. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Family, just in this atmosphere, I'd just like to invite you to just bring your tithes and offering just as an act of worship to the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Love you, Lord. Love you, Lord.
within us Lord Jesus we just want to thank you Heavenly Father that we can look back what you've done and step with boldness to worship you because you have done it all for us Lord Jesus today we choose O King of Glory to be renewed by your word to be renewed at just a revival in our lives O King of Glory we stepped out O God in boldness O God to be able to reflect Christ everywhere we are God in our workplaces O God in our families Lord Jesus in our friendships, O oh King of Glory, we just want to reflect you, King of Glory. Heavenly Father, we just want to worship you. We worship you, Abba Father. Thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like to invite you to take a seat. Again, thank you so much for being with us. And for those of you who are joining online, really, very, very grateful to have you with us. Just before Pastor Kevin comes up, there are a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. And the first is that on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we're going to have our life groups meeting again. So in the, if you're not a member of a life group that meets in your community, please feel free to join us here at the Pottersville Church. And we'll be able to, if you're not in a group, we'll find a group for you to just dig deeper into the Word of God. And it's an opportunity for us to draw closer to each other in fellowship and to build each other up and to remember to pray for each other's concerns as we go throughout the week. Then also, we have got a Connect class for those of you who uh, have not yet connected with the Pottersville Church, please uh, think about it and join a Connect class because it helps you to recognize the history and the background, the, the core values that we have, the principles that we live by, and also it makes available to you the areas of service that you can volunteer for if you're a connected member. And so please do connect if you haven't done so yet. Then also, I'd like just to remind those of you who need, feel like you need inner healing. 
We've got Ancient Paths 1 and Ancient Paths 2. That just helps you through this. If you've never been on Ancient Paths, or if it's been a long time since you have been on Ancient Paths, then I recommend that you speak to Mauritius and Serene van der Westhuizen, and they will take you through the course. It really is faith-building, and it brings inner, deep inner healing. That said, can I ask you to give a warm welcome to Pastor Kevin as he comes forward. Almighty God, loving Father, we're just so grateful to you for this weekend where we recognize the depth of your love and the extent that you will go to in order to bring us back to you in that relationship. And as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday today, Father, I pray that as you speak through Pastor Kevin, that we will receive his word, that it will find a place in our hearts and that it will alter our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 He is risen. Can I ask you just to turn to your neighbor and say, I pray the Lord bless you with resurrection life in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, today we enjoy the symbolism of the power of the resurrection life that Jesus gives us. Some of you might be wondering, why does church meet on a Sunday morning? And if you look at uh, Luke chapter 24, we'll see that Luke chapter 24 verse 1 says, and we're going to be mainly in Luke 24, if you can keep your finger in that place. Now on the first day of the week, that's today. Tell your neighbor, that's today. So the first day of the week is actually Sunday. The last day of the week, day of rest, was Saturday for the Hebrews. And Sunday is the first day. And this is why we come to fellowship on Sunday, because it marks the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Very early in the morning, they, the ladies, and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Can you imagine the stone, the resurrection power and life of Christ rolling the stone away. And so you can imagine when they get down there, they have no concept of the resurrection life, resurrection power of God. They have no concept. They get down there, they're confused. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, confused about this, that behold, Two men stood by them in shining garments. The book of John clarifies this and explains this a little bit further in John 20 verse 12, where the scripture says, and she saw two angels, tell your neighbor two angels, in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain, these two angels, one at the head, one at the feet, were looking down at the slab of stone where Jesus had laid down. That's incredible. Because, you see, prophetically, the mercy seat of God, which was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that God had described to be made for him, to represent the presence of God, was built, and you see the picture of the Ark of the Covenant there. It had an angel at the head, and it had an angel at the feet. And both of these angels were looking down on the mercy seat where the blood of the Lamb was to go. And if you were to open the Ark of the Covenant, you would find three elements in there that are significant. The first is a golden jar filled with manna. It was symbolism that God is your provider. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider. That Jesus would fully provide for you. That man wouldn't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the Father's mouth. And the angels were looking down on the mercy seat where the blood of the Lamb was, knowing that Jesus is the provision. And with that, there's this two tablets of stone. The stone that Moses had carved on the 
commandments of God, the law of God, was there too. And Jesus' blood had covered the law so that His grace is sufficient. He had fulfilled the law. He who knew no sin literally became sin, absorbed our sin upon Him and into His body. He had fulfilled the law. There was also the budding rod of Aaron right there in that Ark of the Covenant, which represented the royal priesthood that God had said that Aaron would be the priest. Jesus was the high priest. He had budded and flowered and flourished and produced the authority. And here he comes, having shed his blood for you and I, he was the Passover lamb on the mercy seat of God, fulfilling the provision of God, the law of God, and the authority of God, the budding rod. As they stood there, recognizing that something special happened, the ladies, you can imagine their confusion because all they see is these two angels, one at the head and one at the feet. They haven't got a grasp of the provision of God nor the tablets of stone, nor the budding rod. They hadn't grasped the provision of the Passover lamb. But I feel that today, many of us are in the same place. Many of us feel like we're locked in the tomb when the stone has been rolled away. Many of us are in this place of confusion and trauma, feeling like we're trapped in relationships or finances, feeling like we're trapped in places, and yet God has rolled the stone away. Tell your neighbor, God's rolled the stone. In Luke 24, verse 6, the scripture says, the angel said, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Then they said, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. Remember how he spoke to you. Remember his words. Remember his promises. Remember his instruction. Remember his commandment. Remember what he said. I want to talk to you about something that I feel like the Lord has really put on our hearts for today. And it's the power of remembrance. Can you tell your neighbor the power of remembrance? Power. There is power in remembering. There's a power in remembering, especially in remembering what Jesus said, remembering his word. But can you imagine how the woman felt that day? Here these angels are saying to them, remember what he said, remember his word, remember his instructions. I don't know about you, but I've been through traumatic situations where, for example, one time I was driving up the road up the Malaguan years ago before the highway, and uh, somebody ran across the highway and I hit them. And uh, it, their body flew over the car. They landed on the ground and miraculously they were fine. Miraculously I was able to put them in the car and take them to the hospital. And, but you know, the trauma of seeing that person, even though the person's well now, even though the person's healthy, even though there's the miracle of not a bone being broken, the, the person absolutely fine, but the trauma of seeing that just flooded me. I remember sitting at my desk at work at the hotel and, and not being able to think clearly. You know, you shuffle one piece of paper from one side of the desk to the other side of the desk and at the end of the day, done nothing but all I can think about is this thing. This, I've hit this person, I've hurt this person and it's replaying in my mind. If you've experienced that before, can I ask you to just put up your hand? Trauma can paralyze our thinking. Fear can paralyze our thinking. Imagine these two ladies. They have been traumatized by the flogging Jesus has received. They saw it. They've been traumatized by Jesus being nailed to the cross. They are the ones who 
helped Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus off the cross, they saw Jesus dead, very dead. They washed his body. They helped put linen on him to prepare him that they could come down on the Sunday to put spices and herbs on him. They helped him put him into the cave, the tomb. They helped roll the stone closed. They would have been traumatized. And now the angels are standing saying, remember his words. I don't know about you, but I find that for me, trauma, trauma gets me to think of only the bad things. I remember a season in my life where when I was reflecting on memories, I confess to you, all I could think of was bad memories. Have you noticed when you are in a place of offense or unforgiveness, where you have seen deep injustice, all you can remember is the bad things about those people, you know, that person, those people. Do you agree with me? And suddenly the good memories dissipate. Suddenly the good things are gone. You have very few good memories. It's like the bad memories wash away the good memories. Trauma does that. Fear paralyzes us. It paralyzes our memory. It paralyzes what was said. It paralyzes the good moments that we don't remember the good moments. And so I believe the Holy Spirit is ministering today to speak to us to say the power of remembrance that we need to first, just as the angels said to these ladies, remember what Jesus said. Remember what he said, because some of us, and prophetically, can I just say this? I just feel prophetically I need to say, across this nation, we've seen trauma across our nation, haven't we? We've seen economic collapse, we've seen uprisings, we've seen trauma. We've seen injustice in many forms. But I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, Remember what Jesus has said about Eswatini. Remember what Jesus has said about you. Remember what Jesus has said for you. Because God wants us to remember what He said. His words, His prophecy, His vision. Because we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the Father's mouth. Some of us right now are going through a lot of trauma. And like these two women, you're probably thinking as these angels speak, as I'm sharing with you, you might be thinking, I think the ladies would have been thinking, okay, thanks for telling me to remember what he said. I can't remember what he said right now. I've got this trauma. Just fix the situation. Where's the body of Jesus? Just fix the situation. Fix this trauma. Fix me. Just hurry up and fix this but that wasn't the Lord's message through the angels. The Lord's message was, remember his words. And so I believe prophetically the Lord would say to you, remember his promises for you. Remember his words to you. Tell your neighbor, remember his words. Because there's resurrection power in the word of God. There's resurrection life in the word of God. There's resurrection healing in the Word of God. There's resurrection provision in the Word of God. The devil wants us to live in a place of fear. That's why he has the spirit of fear, the spirit of intimidation. He wants you to focus on the fear. He wants you to focus on the lack of provision. He wants you to focus on the trauma. Because when you do that, you forget what the Lord says. This morning, I believe the Lord is coming and saying to each one of us this morning, remember Jesus' words. Because His word goes forth and doesn't return void. It accomplishes that which He sends it to do. His word, He says, His word is a light unto your path, a lamp unto your feet. His word says, He's the way, He's the truth, and He's the resurrection life. His word says, he came to give you life and not just life. 
He came to give you abundant life. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and speak over your neighbor, I bless you with abundant life. His word came to give you abundant life, Zoe life. His word came to give you identity. His word came to give you purpose. His word came to give you faith, hope, and love. But maybe all you can remember right now, just like the ladies, I imagine the first thing they thought of was, but I remember Jesus in the garden sweating blood. I remember Jesus struggling. Maybe you caught up with the trauma. The trauma of the blood. The trauma of the suffering. Like Jesus when he was praying. The heart of the Father this morning is to pause and ask yourself the question. How do you use your memory? Because you use it. You do use it. You use it to remember offenses. You use it to remember unforgiveness. You, remember, you use it to remember what people have done, how they've disappointed you. How do you use your memory? Do you use it to intentionally remember Jesus' words, intentionally remember his prophecies? By the way, Helen is amazing. The Lord blessed me with an incredible wife. She's kept all the prophecies over the years over our family. And whenever we're going through a tough time, out come the prophecies. And she starts reading the prophecies and starts claiming the prophecies to remember His words. And I challenge you to do the same. Remember His words. Because there's power in remembering His word. We anchor to His word. There's resurrection life according to his word. The second thing we need to remember, I believe this morning is, remember his words, remember he chose you. I'm not saying this lightly. He looked at the cross, and then he looked back at you. Remember that he knew from Isaiah 53, he was going to the cross. He knew that he would suffer and struggle. He looked at the cross, and then looked back at you, and he said, you're worth it. He chose you. Remember, He chose you. Even if you're in this traumatic situation and you're in this place of crossroads and you're feeling like there's strife, there's trauma, there's fear, there's worry about what the next step is, just relax and remember, He chose you. He chose you so much that He went to the cross. He endured the cross for the joy of the Lord. He, his joy is you. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus himself says, and he's talking to you. Tell your neighbor, this is for you. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Let me say it again. He went to the cross for you and I. For the wages of our sin. He chose the cross for you. Ephesians 1.4, Paul says this. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He chose us. He could have come down from the cross at any point in time. He could have called a legion of angels to rescue him from the cross and save him from the pain. But he stayed there because he chose you. He had to pay the price for our sin. As we remember what he went through, it's important, I believe, to remember what he went through. Remember what he went through was because he chose you. 
The first thing, just to remind you, is that what Jesus did is already in the garden of Gethsemane, he sweated blood for you. He went through sweating of blood for you. He was so anxious that he started to sweat blood. This syndrome, this syndrome of sweating blood, it's from a place of high anxiety. And within that place, what happens is your skin gets super sensitive. He suffered this syndrome for us. But the consequence of that is his syndrome was that, that his skin became a lot more sensitive. And so when Jesus was flogged, remember that when he was flogged, he was flogged with fury. He wasn't just flogged. He was flogged with fury. They were so angry with him that he had claimed to be the king of kings. The Pharisees wanted him dead. The Romans wanted him dead. So when they flogged him, they intended to flog him to an inch of death. The leather straps were filled with ivory that had been sharpened into sharp points. They took teeth, they took bones, and they sharpened these. They took lead weights and stone. So that when the whip came round, what would happen is the whip would, would come round the body and the, the bone would pierce the skin of the already sensitive skin, rip into it, and then when they pulled it back, it would pull, pull the skin off the body. The sufferer's veins, the veins would have been exposed. The muscle would have been exposed. The sinews would have been exposed. The bowels would have been exposed. It was horrific. Whilst the objective would have been to bring him with an inch of death, they did it to try and intentionally not kill him. His flesh was totally torn. No wonder Isaiah says that he was not someone we would want to be. You know, sometimes it was so ba bad that the victim's back, the, the, the little, literally the spinal cord would have been exposed by the deep, deep cuts and wounds. As you think about that, think about the fact that for the joy that was set before him, what does that mean? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The joy wasn't the cross. The joy was you. He endured it for you. Look at this prophecy again with this in mind. It's Isaiah 53, verse 5. Hundreds of years before Christ goes to the cross, the prophecy is, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, by his flogging, by his beating, we are healed. That we can enjoy the provision of, gra of grace. This morning, remember his words and remember he chose you. That none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. I pray the Holy Spirit will remind you that he chose you. That he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we're healed. This morning, some of you are struggling with sickness. By his stripes, I pray resurrection life fill you and that you be healed in Jesus' name. He literally wore the crown of thorns and a robe for us. They mocked him. They called him the king of, king of the Jews because he, he's the king of kings. And they mocked him, calling him king of kings too. They took a, a crown of thorns with deep, long thorns and they pushed the thorns into his scalp which bleeds a lot, already sensitive skin, already whipped and bruised. He, 
he received this crown of thorns as they pushed the thorns into his head. And then they mockingly put the robe on his back as the blood clotted, sticking the robe to the blood clots. So that later, laughingly, they ripped that robe off. So all the scabs and the blood clots was ripped off and blood flowed again. To throw him on the ground and nail his hands, his wrists, nail his wrists, nail his feet to the cross. Remember, he chose you. Having experienced the unthinkable pain, he allowed them to drive nails into his hands and his feet. He wears the crown for you and I. He wears the robe for you and I. He went to the cross for us. The positioning of a person on the cross, the Romans did deliberately. They positioned their feet and their arms spread so that what had happened is as you breathe, it would be painful but releasing oxygen was more painful than breathing in. Because as you release oxygen and let the air out, what actually happens is the weight goes on the hands and on the feet. So you're in excruciating, literally that word is rightly used, excruciating agony. But the problem is it caused a buildup of carbon dioxide. Inhalation was much more difficult than exhalation. And whilst on the cross, they take the spear, and he took the spear for us, where that spear goes into the side, into his heart, so that blood and water flow out. He took the spear for us. They mocked him. They jeered at him. I can't imagine the physical pain. I can't imagine the emotional pain of watching the church, the Pharisees, the scribes mocking him. I can't imagine the pain of him feeling abandoned. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As he became sin for us, as he took our sin on him. And he was dead now. As the spear goes into his side, he took the spear for us, that blood and water would flow out. John 19, verse 34, he says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out, symbolizing that he was dead, medically that he was dead. Joseph of Arimathea asks Pontius Pilate if he can go and get the body of Jesus off the cross and Pilate gives him permission, so he takes the body of Jesus off the cross. Nicodemus came as well. He bought myrrh and spices and linen, and they washed his body and prepared his body for a couple of days before the ladies would come and do more because they had to rush. The law required them to be at home and ready for the Sabbath. And so as the law is custom, they rushed home. He died for us. He fulfilled the law for us. So now just pause for a moment. Imagine these two ladies. They now come down to the tomb. The stones rolled away. Can you imagine what's going through their mind? Can you imagine the trauma? And the angels say, remember what he told you way back in Galilee. That's why I think it would have been difficult for them to recognize that. In John 2.22, as they remembered, the scripture tells us, Jesus lays this out in John. He says in John 2 verse 22, therefore, when Jesus had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said to them that he would have to be punished and resurrected. In John 12, verse 16, his disciples didn't understand these things at first, that he would have to go to the cross. But when Jesus was glorified, when he was raised from the dead, they remembered these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. 
Can you tell your neighbor they remembered? God gave you a memory. And God wants you to use your memory. God wants you to remember what He said. God wants you to remember He chose you. And God wants you to remember who He is. Tell your neighbor, remember who He is. I mean, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is God. This is fully God, fully man. This is Jesus. He reminds them that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, must be crucified, and that He would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered this is what He had said. This is God. This is Jesus. And Jesus is the visible expression of Father God. Remember Colossians 1.15, He says this. In Colossians 1.15, He says, He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is God. Paul would later say in Ephesians 1.19, listen to the scripture, the exceeding greatness of his power available towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is Jesus. And the same power that's available to him is available to you. (laughs) When the two ladies in Luke 24 heard the angels, they didn't know what to do. So verse 9 says they rushed back to the disciples from the tomb to tell his disciples what they'd seen and what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who had told the apostles what had happened. Now look at this. Verse 11. Could you read with me? But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. Sometimes the prophecies God gives you, sometimes the promises God gives you when you're in a traumatic situation, sounds impossible, sounds like nonsense. God wants resurrection life in your marriage, in your family. God wants resurrection life in your health. God wants resurrection life in your journey with Him. But this is sometimes how we handle our memory. We're reminded of something, we think, oh, that's nonsense. It can't be true. Because trauma and fear confuses us. I want to remind you, God gave you a memory. How do you use your memory? Are you recalibrating and aligning to God or you're aligning to your fears and trauma? Are you letting God lead you or are you letting fear lead you? Are you letting trauma lead you? Are you letting your flesh lead you or are you letting God lead you? When Peter heard this in, in verse 12, the scripture says, however, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb. Stooping in at the tomb, he peered and he saw empty linen wrappings. I can imagine him getting confused because those empty linen wrappings folded neatly. Must have reminded him of Passover when Jesus took the bread and broke it and put it into the linen and folded the linen neatly and hid it away as is the custom of Passover, how that would have been revealed to him as he looked at that. And he walked back trying to work out what had happened and gathered in the room with the disciples. As they gathered in the room together, filled with fear because they didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand. They were filled with fear. They were traumatized. Jesus, with his great sense of humor, with his great love, in Luke 24, verse 36, Jesus literally walks through the wall and steps into the room. And he says to these traumatized, fearful disciples, he says to them, peace be to you. Can you imagine them as Jesus steps through the wall and he says, peace be to you. They would have been shaken. In verse 46, he says, Thus it's written, and thus it was necessary 
for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of Jesus to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And then he turns the conversation, tell your neighbor, wake up now. He says this in verse 48, and you, and he's talking to us, and you are witnesses of these things. You're witness of what Jesus has done. And he says, behold, I send the promise of my Father, the Holy Spirit. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, stay in the city of Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. Remember who he is. He's God. But the last point is this. Remember who, whose you are. Remember whose you are. You are God's son. You were formed by God in your mother's womb. He knew you before you were born. He chose you before the foundation of the earth. He chose you before you were born. He formed you. He anointed you. He has plans and purposes for you. He has a hope for you. He has a future for you. You are his son, his daughter. Listen to 1 John 3, 2. He says, Beloved, he's talking to you. Beloved, now we are children of God. We are his. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He says to you, I will not leave you as orphans. Right now you might feel like you're unprotected. But he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. He says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. You are more than conquerors, he says. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Prophetically for this church, for our family, can I just say, I feel like the Lord is saying this. Don't let the post-COVID world, don't let the financial shakeups in this whole world don't let what we see going around shake you, traumatize you. Don't let the spirit of fear come upon you because he's given you power, love, and a sound mind. You belong to Jesus. He chose you. Remember whose you are. He makes all the difference because he brings new life, new hope, new grace, new mercies. Remember his word. Remember you're chosen. Remember who he is. And remember whose you are. Can I invite the worship team up and can I ask you just to bow your heads this morning, please, as the worship team comes up. Some of you this morning, I just sense, I just sense that you've allowed your memories You've allowed trauma of broken relationships, trauma of financial tensions, trauma of career endings, trauma of businesses closing, trauma of loss, trauma of loss of loved ones. You've allowed that to cause you to lay down the promises of God the prophetic word of God. And you've allowed this world to shape your decisions, shape your steps forward. And I believe that the Lord is saying this morning to you, like to the woman, remember what he said. Remember his word for you. Remember he chose you and he'll never give up on you. He loves you. Remember who he is. He is God. He is not a man that he should lie. His word goes forth and accomplishes that which he sends it to do. And remember whose you are. You are his. Called to be ambassadors. Called to be the royal priesthood. And I believe the Holy Spirit is 
hovering right across this room this morning, everyone under the sound of my voice and those who are on internet right now. And the Lord is stirring visions that you've had in the past, dreams that you've had, prophetic words that you've had, that you've laid down and you've, like the disciples, you've considered it nonsense. Can't be possible because I'm in this situation. And the Lord is coming today to say, He is God and He has called for you for such a time and for such a purpose as this. Allow Him to shape your memory. Allow His Word to shape your memory. Allow His Word to be a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path, in Jesus' name. Just if, if you recognize that you've allowed fear, you've allowed trauma, you've allowed failure, and you've allowed experience to shape you, and you want those chains snapped off you. You want resurrection life to come upon you and to be ignited again with God's vision. You want the belief of nonsense to be removed and you want the belief in God's word to come into you this morning. Can I ask you to just stand before God and just say, Father, that's me. I want resurrection life in my memory. I want resurrection life in, in remembering your words, remembering you chose me. Remembering who you are and remembering who, whose I am. Can I ask you to stand before the Lord if that's you this morning? If you recognize you've allowed fear, failure, or situations to shape you and you want to stand against that this morning and stand in God's resurrection life for your marriage, for your family, for your children, for your, the work that God has called you to, can I ask you to stand before God if that's you this morning? You're not too old. You're not too young. God called Moses when he was 80. <laughs> and God called Jeremiah when he was very young. God said, do not despise your youth. Father, we stand before you and we ask you for forgiveness for the times we've allowed fear to shape us, trauma to shape us, experiences to shape us, but today, we choose to believe you and your resurrection life. And we invite your resurrection life into us in Jesus' name. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. As we go into a time of worshiping God, singing your grace is enough. I believe across the room, there's some people who've got just bad memories and God wants to give you good memories. As we sing, your grace is enough and you want resurrection life flowing through you, can I invite you just to kneel before the Lord as you recommit your memories, your life to the resurrection life of God. He called you to be a royal priesthood. He calls you blessed. He calls you favored. He calls you chosen. This morning, let's realign to Him in Jesus' name. For those of you who maybe haven't given your life to Christ or you want to recommit to Christ, we're going to open the door on the left here, on my left, and they're going to stand there and welcome you as they pray with you for resurrection life to flow in you and in your relationships. In Jesus' name. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, just turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you with resurrection life with healthy memories in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Him.
worship you we worship you and Lord we take these memories that have shaped us and we lay them at your feet and we ask you now for the memory of your words the memory of your promises the memory of your plans the memory of your hope we invite you to give us the mind of Christ the Holy Spirit we welcome you Father in Jesus' name. As I'm praying, there's a sense across the room that if you haven't received the Holy Spirit or you need prayer for the Holy Spirit to fill you, can I invite the altars to be opened that as we close and leave, feel free to come to the front as the ministering team lay their hands upon you and pray that you be filled and refreshed, renewed by the Holy Spirit. We need to receive Him daily. We need infilling daily. May the Lord bless you with His memories. May the Lord bless you with His joy. May the Lord bless you with His grace. May the Lord bless you with His promises in Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. You who He calls beloved and blessed. God bless you. Your word, I will be.